Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to, as Mark said, talk about the uh, payers workshop that was held last fall at the NIH. It was a collaboration between CMTP and NHGRI. Um, and a number of us in the room are also, um, <clears throat> excuse me, at the workshop. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk for a few minutes and I'm going to open it up for anyone else who has additional reflections, things that I might have missed. So what's the central issue here? Um, I think the basic issue is that for the promise of genomic medicine to be fulfilled, there's a need for genomics-based tests to be reimbursed. And as we've been talking about a lot of the past day, um, this coverage is contingent upon um, demonstrating clinical utility. And for a lot of these tests, the, um, there is insufficient evidence of clinical utility per to persuade payers that these are things that are clearly worth testing. So there are questions about who should be paying for the test, uh, excuse me, who should be, what research needs to be done in order for the test to be, for clinical utility to be demonstrated, um, who should be doing that research. And the concern is that in the meantime, this is stymieing coverage and reimbursement for tests. So I wasn't actually at Genomic Medicine 3 um, in Chicago, um, but I know that these were some of the reasons why um, payers and health insurance issuers were invited to that to start to engage in a dialogue. And as a consequence of this, some of the questions that um, came out of that, um, what research could NHGRI support to develop evidence um, of some of the key tests? With whom could NHGRI? Um, is there some way in which we could exp um, make use of some of the clinical data which um, payers have? Um, what are the endpoints that influence coverage decisions by health insurance issuers? Is it just clinical utility or is it other health efficiencies like length of hospitalization and so on? And Given that so many of these tests don't have clear clinical utility, are there innovative ways in which payment is being done and, and patients are receiving tests um, in the absence of that clear data? So after um, the workshop, we had a subsequent call with um, Sean Tunis and his colleagues at the Center for Medical Technology Policy, and that was the origins of this workshop that was held in October. So as I was mentioning, several members of the Genomic Medicine Working Group were there. There were also a number of payers. We had a um, representative from WellPoint, some from Palmetto GBA, which is a Medicare contractor. Um, as someone mentioned yesterday, CMS was also there. A number of test developers were also represented, Myriad Genomic Health, um, Everson Genetics. Um, Wien Curry was there representing the CDC. Uh, Eric and Laura and Jean, a number of NHGRI staff were there, and uh, a key um, group that I missed off, unfortunately, this slide is the Center for Medical Technology Policy, the group that we um, worked with. So we decided to focus, um, to structure the workshop on four test cases. Some of these, they're, they're um, a little different in the details, but some of these uh, they, it are instances where there is limited evidence of clinical utility of a test, but where uh, an insurer is nevertheless willing to pay and patients are getting access to the test. The first one is the one that I think it was Mark mentioned yesterday. In 2009, CMS announced that they were going to um, for pharmacogenomic testing for warfarin, they're going to um, they, they, they start a coverage with evidence development policy. And what that means is that they are willing to pay for cover um, warfarin testing, but only if a patient is in a clinical trial. So Jeff Roche um, presented from CMS, and then we had a representative of Everson Genetics who is funding a, a, a clinical trial to look at whether about the impact is of warfarin testing on hospitalizations of um, severe clinical events. And they're expecting that research to come out at the end of this year. 
Um, we also had a couple of representatives from Genomic Health who talked about their performance-based risk-sharing agreement they had with United Healthcare with regard to Oncotype DX coverage. They weren't at um, liberty to give us all the details of the exact agreement between them, but it, it was related to whether use of uh, co the collection of the data to see if the use of Oncotype DX would reduce um, referrals for chemotherapy. Um, then a couple of former um, uh, colleagues of, uh, of Medco talked about a partnership that they had with the Mayo Clinic, again, where they were looking at what the effect of was um, warfarin testing. And then lastly, a little bit of a, a different one. I, I, I'm sure many of you will have heard about Palmetto GBA's um, initiative they started last year, the MOLDEX um, program. Um, one of the challenges that the, this Medicare contractor reported as having was that they were getting bills from labs and they really had, they had a limited understanding of what exactly it was they were paying for. So they would get a bill from one lab for $150, another bill from another lab for $650, and to them it looked like they were paying for the same test. So to address this, they started this program where um, if you want to be reimbursed for a particular test, you have to let Palmetto know exactly what it is that you're doing, what the analytical validity is, what the clinical validity is, what the clinical utility is, and then they make a decision as to whether they think it's uh, reasonable and necessary for the Medicare population um, that's there, um, that they are responsible for. Um, and so, the, so we, were, we uh, considered all these examples and were discussing whether these could be models for broader application, whether there are others that could do similar kinds of things, and to listen to some of the emerging themes. So see, these were some of the things that came out. Um, one thing that's apparent is that there's little consensus. We can't think of all payers as being the same. And the United Health example, they were interested in referrals to chemotherapy. I don't know that that would particularly fit with CMS, um, because CMS says, well, they strictly look at patient outcomes. Those are the kinds of barometers they look at. So it's um, in, in answering the question, what is it that insurers want to see in order to determine whether something has validity or value, it's a, it's a complex question to answer. Um, it, is, it was apparent that, well, from the examples and from the discussion, that payers are willing to consider evidence other than randomized clinical trials. Um, the Palmetto representative, Becky Turner, was clarifying that they certainly, you know, that's the gold standard, but they are willing to consider other evidence and whether, whether a test has clinical utility or not. Um, we also discussed Medicare statutory limitations. So Medicare can't pay for preventive services. Medicare can't pay for confirmation of a diagnosis as opposed to making a diagnosis. And I think this is a something we need to think about because if um, Medicare is often used by other payers as a reference point, and if they're not paying for genomics-based services because it doesn't make sense for their population or it doesn't fit within the statute within which they operate, then that, there might be something we might want to think about how uh, the other payers may not also adopt for that, that reason. Um, there, are, there was a discussion about who is responsible for funding this evidence base. It was quite clear from some of the payers that they don't think that that's their job. You bring them the evidence when, you've got, when you think you can justify, this is something they need to pay for. And also, as was alluded to yesterday, it was apparent that there are some complications when it comes to sharing of patient data between a, a, a provider of health insurance and a test developer. So we came up with a, a few action items, um, some of which are now underway. Um, the first was to write a white paper summarizing some of these um, case studies, thinking it might not be apparent to everyone that these, the, these are options, these are ways in which uh, things are being done to get around the clinical utility problem. And also to summarize some of those emerging themes. Um, we're going to conduct a policy analysis on data sharing, what the issues are. Of course, HIPAA is an issue. Pearl mentioned yesterday about some state laws. There may be other things, we, that, so that'll be, um, we're gonna be get going on that next month. 
Um, Mark's going to be leading an effort on uh, r research on physician ordering of tests. So one of the points that came up was that no matter how good the clinical utility is, if it's not being ordered appropriately or interpreted appropriately by physicians, then of course that, that clinical utility is uh, very much limited. And then um, another point that was made, there were so many of these tests with so little clinical utility, perhaps we ought to think about how to um, prioritize these. And lastly, um, there was the discussion about how much of an investment it is to do clinical utility research. So there was some kind of an idea of how, if there might be a, some way in which to provide some kind of infrastructure by which this could happen. So the white paper is an early draft is ongoing. The, um, the, the second and the third were just starting working on those. The fourth and the fifth um, haven't started yet. So if you want to, I've tried to summarize everything that was in the workshop, but if you want to read in more detail, um, you go to that URL and it'll um, give you a more in-depth summary of the workshop. So I was also asked to come up with one or two ideas as to what might be next steps for uh, things to think about. So these are completely unvetted. They're just things in my head, so <laughs> take them as you will. Um, but, it, but it struck me that perhaps one of the things we want to do is to talk to some of the decision makers who really um, are responsible for determining what gets covered, who gets covered, and how, whether it's actuaries, underwriters, try to truly really try to understand things from their point of view. Um, something else that struck me is that we often talk about the lack of coverage, but we rarely do we specify which tests we think really ought to be covered right now and which to have clear clinical utility, but where um, health insurance issuers aren't picking them up. So I, I think that it would be interesting to discuss which tests should be covered right now and which tests might be appropriate for these, this coverage with evidence development kind of model. And I use that broadly. Um, and then if that would certainly be interesting to look at what could be covered by what currently is covered. And lastly, I think one of the, the longer term goals of what HDRI is thinking about how we could either fund research or partner with others in research. Um, lastly, I just want to flag a number of other issues that are um, out there which weren't really addressed by the workshop but are certainly within the realm of coverage and reimbursement. And the question is whether NHGRI would want to take a lead role on this, whether we want to partner, whether it's just something we want to monitor and be aware of. Um, the first is that Jeff Roche of CMS uh, said quite clearly that if, you know, if there was an application, for example, uh, for instance, of whole genome sequencing that, that fit their definition of reasonable and necessary for the Medicare population, that's something they would definitely entertain. So it might be worth thinking about whether there's a case that could be made for something like that. And to, again, to try to understand things from their point of view, recognizing, of course, as I was saying before, the central role of Medicare. Um, then there are some of these other things that are going on. Um, some of you are definitely interested to the um, AMA is the, and, and CMS is the adoption of new CPT codes. This is going to allow better tracking of which tests are being done. And there was a discussion at the workshop and um, uh, kind of parallel to that. Um, there's a lot of enthusiasm for the MOLDEX initiative and there are questions whether the, you know, this is just something that's happening within um, the California and the other states within the purview of Palmetto GBA in that Medicare contract area, where this is something that should be a, a national program. Um, for the genetic counselors, um, covered the most important coverage and reimbursement issue is um, direct billing, of course. Um, something that I thought might be interesting to look at, we know the FDA now has over 100 drugs where on the label it has some kind of genetic, some kind of pharmacogenomic indication. And given that there is great concern about how um, physicians are misusing the tests or um, misinterpreting the tests. It might be interesting to look at some of those and to ask whether we think that they are really um, clear as to what the, the use of the test and what the use um, in helping administer the drug is. Um, lastly, the, a couple of things with the Affordable Care Act, the exchanges um, kick in in 2014, and one of the 
pieces to that is that each state is coming up with uh, defining what are the essential healthcare benefits that, that need to be covered in order to be the, in the exchanges. So your question is, do we think there's, there's anything um, within genomics that meets that bar? And similarly, the, the, you know, the, the recommendations of the US Preventive Services Task Force um, have been elevated, I think, to a new height with the passage of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and so there are requirements if there's, um, if, there's a recommend, if there's an A or B recommendation from the task force, um, that there are requirements for health insurers to follow that recommendation and coverage decisions. Um, so there are, the, the question is whether we think there's anything within genomics that they, we would want them to consider. So those are just um, some ideas. So uh, I, I'd like to thank Mark and Jean, who are on endless uh, planning calls for the workshop. I know Mark enjoyed them particularly, as well as uh, Laura. And then Laura Kuntz, who is instrumental now, um, who is a fellow in our office currently in Louise Slaughter's office and gone to the Hill now, as well as um, the CMTP staff who are instrumental. Uh, so with that, I, I, you know, I don't, uh, hopefully I've tried to give an overview, but there are many of you there, so Mark, Jean, or whoever else might want to mention one or two things that things I've skipped over or missed. Just to make the observation that those four examples dealt with really serious clinical problems, two with warfarin. If a patient started on warfarin, it's my understanding that a quarter of them are in an ER within a period of time with either clots or bleeding. So that's a serious problem. Another one is whether a, a, a woman with breast cancer has to get chemotherapy or not. And then the, the other one had to do with the correct approach to lung cancer with uh, targeted therapy. So somehow out of the mix, uh, they chose really important clinical questions. Let's start with um, Jeff, and then Mark, and then Bruce. I have um, two questions. The first is, uh, could you clarify whether there was an explicit commitment from the payers to actually fund research on clinical utility, um, or is that an, an aspirational goal for the for there was a, I would say it was more correct to say there was a spe specific um, commitment not to do so. <laughs> In that, um, I mean, <laughs> we you. only had a, a few representatives there, but I, I, I think um, from, the <clears throat> from the few that we had, I think they don't see it as their job. You know, if you want to go to them and justify why you think your test needs to be covered, then they will consider it and they will look at the literature but they are not going to a priori go out there and do the research themselves in order to determine whether they ought to cover the test. That was but, certainly what I heard anyway. But I think one of the things that was discussed was the idea of um, could there be innovations in coverage design that could somehow facilitate uh, collection of the data around certain key questions that the payers wanted answered. So for example, the United Healthcare scenario, they were, um, they were reasonably convinced that Oncotype DX was useful and, and had utility based on the uh, evidence, but they were not convinced that clinicians would actually use the information to change um, a care. Uh, so that what they were concerned about was that they were going to pay several hundred dollars for a test and everybody was going to get chemotherapy anyway. And so the, the way they set that up was to say, uh, we, will give, we will give you a target and if you uh, can demonstrate to us that this does in fact change the care in some predefined, and we didn't get all the details about how the, uh, this was set up because that was done under a proprietary situation. We will pay you for the test. And so they, they worked directly with the test provider uh, to collect data uh, where the, so the test provider actually contacted all the clinicians that ordered the test after the test results were given and then collected data on whether or not chemotherapy was given. And they actually then hit um, it, the target that uh, United had set in conjunction with them and, and they were reimbursed for the test. So it's, it was that sort of idea which is that no, they don't want to pay for research because that's not really what their job is. It's, um, but they're not necessarily averse to thinking about different ways of using their benefit structure to uh, 
encourage collection of data that they think is key to making decisions. And, and I mentioned yesterday, I did follow up, uh, since WellPoint's headquartered in Chicago, I did follow up with the uh, WellPoint representative, and they are very anxious in partnering with us to provide data that may be useful. So I, I think as a first step, we should really f make sure we take them up on that offer. Yeah, so the, the, the data, you know, um, one of the things that we found, uh, particularly in the Mayo Medco study, was the idea that there are data sources out there, in this case a pharmacy benefit manager that has a lot of data that could potentially be used to answer uh, research questions, and that there was willingness, um, uh, I think under certain conditions, to be able to share some of those data to be able to, again, answer uh, specific questions. So it's just, a, you know, for us to think about other places to look for the data that we're interested in. Yeah, that could be that could be incredibly valuable outcomes measures for some of our uh, uh, initiatives. So my, my my second question, maybe it's a brief answer, but did you have a chance to explore um, how they are thinking about covering uh, clinical genomic clinical genome sequencing? Um, and, and, you know, with with there, we've heard. We didn't uh, talk about it. I mean, I think that's the fair thing. We really talked about these four use cases and innovative design. So we did not get into the space of saying, here's what's coming down the road, and really spend much time talking about that. I, I think oncology is a, an excellent area to look at. Um, and um, first of all, in regard to the genomic health, it's several thousand dollars, not several hundred. That sounds like a lot, but it's not, because in oncology, payers are reimbursing $10,000 a month or more for treatment regimens. And in fact, you could say diagnostics are a drop in the bucket of the national problem regarding oncology costs. And so I, I think it would be very useful to analyze the entire oncology model. The other thing to keep in mind is that you may be talking to CMS regarding national policy, but the local coverage decisions are rampant, and there are I won't say hundreds, but there are many companies out there that have seduced the, uh, the local provider into making a local coverage decision for a, for a laboratory, which then allows them to, of course, receive samples from anywhere in the country and bypass national policy. So I think you need to, to really look carefully, not just at national policy, but at all the local coverage decisions regarding oncology testing, not just genomics, but there's a lot of companies out there selling chemotherapy testing, things like that. And often these tests are ordered by providers who don't know what to do because the patient has uh, progressed on all evidence-based regimens, and so they're looking for some justification to give more treatment and add more costs. And so they order a test of no proven value and then they give more therapies that add more costs of no value. And so this is a real mess, and I'd be happy to work with you guys on this. Yeah, we um, uh, actually, that uh, did uh, come up, and we did talk about that. Uh, and one of the use cases was uh, that a demonstration project that CMS funded to have a clearinghouse uh, of uh, all laboratory tests to try and get around some of these uh, local coverage decision issues. But that is a topic um, that we are going to be discussing in the work group that I'm going to be running, and I'll sign you up. Okay. So that teach you to say, say, say anything around here. Bruce. I think one of the issues that distresses um, payers and hospitals alike is the tendency to encourage um, what I guess could be described as shotgun testing or bundling of tests that don't include in this genomic sequencing. But there are many examples where a clinical question is, is phrased in a sufficiently vague way that where a $500 test could have answered the question instead a $10,000 test gets sent looking at every possible gene that could ever be imagined to be involved in that phenotype, even though some are much more probable than others. And I, I think that actually, at least in my institution, has actually given genetic testing a bad name in general, because the perception is genetic tests cost $10,000 a shot without realizing that, in fact, if you break them down and use clinical judgment, you can often do them for much less. So I guess, in a way, it broadly comes under the heading of clinical utility, but I think it is a kind of a mountain within that area that needs to be addressed specifically. Yeah, this is the utilization management issue, and again, that'll be under the purview of our group, the appropriate ordering of tests, 
Uh, and as I mentioned yesterday, the uh, ARUP uh, white paper that came out showed that uh, in their uh, portfolio, 30 to $36,000 a month of testing was being ordered inappropriately. And there is no disagreement around anyone that there's any worth to doing inappropriate testing. So, but the challenge, as Derek alluded to in the presentation, was that because of coding issues and other things, it's almost impossible for the payers to actually do effective utilization review uh, on either on the front or the back end. And so this is going to be the area about could we, in fact, develop some solutions that would be able to address this problem. So that, that is high in everybody's priority list because we all recognize that this is just pure and simple waste. There's no impact on, on patient care uh, except to the possibility that we're going to lead to more expenditures and, and as Mark pointed out inappropriate therapies so yeah yeah we want to get rid of that so um, I'm we, I've got several in the queue here so and we're relatively short so I think I'll just kind of keep going but I'll add you to the list Gail um, so several issues that are big obstacles clinically right now are pre-authorizations and the need to test relatives in order to efficiently care for the patient in front of you. Um, and those relatives may not benefit from that test, or they may be deceased, and we may be working with a repository or a tissue sample. And I didn't see you see those on your list of other, and I wondered if either of those was getting bandwidth. I know we had one insurer who used to, if, if a medical geneticist ordered a test that we didn't need to pre-auth it, and they actually got rid of that policy. <clears throat> um, no, that's not something I, I had thought about as I was generating the list, but I did realize as I put the list together, I started thinking of more. So I think there are certainly, that wasn't supposed to be an exhaustive list. It was more like jotting down some of the other things that perhaps we should start to think about. Perhaps that should be, we should add that one. Yeah, and that, that's act, that falls within, I mean, not to, I'm not trying to characterize um, uh, the work group that I'm going to be leading as the be all and end all, but all of the questions to this point have directly impacted on what the meeting actually flagged as a huge problem, which is the, the appropriate um, uh, utilization. Uh, so that will be a, a major focus. Kathy. Um, was there any discussion about the, um, first of all, I have two questions. Any discussion about coverage of interpretation or was it really about specifically the test itself? We didn't really get too much into uh, coverage of interpretation. It was more about whether tests, whether specific, because of the nature of the case studies, it was okay. more about specifically um, the, whether the tests are being covered, but obviously that's an, uh, addition, an additional issue. Although the United um, uh, uh, Genomic uh, Health uh, use case really was about interpretation because it, it was asking the question, do our clinicians using the information, uh, you know, to avoid uh, chemotherapy? So there were, even though the interpretation was not formally measured, it was indirectly measured looking at utilization. Okay. And then my second question, was there any further discussion about um, clinical utility and the lines between that and personal utility or social utility in the sense, or was it, and, and what the value can be of those genetic tests based on those definitions, or was it strictly discussion around clear-cut clinical well, I'm not sure what that is either, but more, clinical more, utility. <laughs> to the extent that we all agree on exactly utility. what clinical utility is, it was more on the latter. There was little discussion of personal utility, what benefits someone might get out of personally, of understanding stuff about their, their genome. And you know, again, it was obviously focused on what health insurance issuers are going to be prepared to pay for. Martin. Um, I just wanted to say that in addition to coverage, there are benefits packages that, you know, so I think having the employers, the large employer groups involved, they may be another source of data. Um, and I, I think their opinions and their understanding of this would be helpful. And, you know, they're, they're often driving what the, the insurers are, are doing. Um, I also just wanted to comment, I am the ACMG representative to the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association Medical Advisory Panel, and I have, um, you know, we're allowed to submit, you know, ideas for future topics, so I, I, I have submitted, you know, whole genome, or I shouldn't say whole, but genome exome sequencing. So That's that not here. Probably... You can say whatever you want. Okay. <laughs> so I'm sure that will be discussed. Um, probably more as an informational piece, um, and then maybe ultimately to kind of look at whatever evidence does exist. So 
in our deliberations, it usually is completely evidence-based because we usually focus on technologies that are controversial and evidence is key. I think the employer piece is a good one. It was something that definitely came up. The challenge, of course, is, is that it's, it's harder to find the, you know, what might be const, uh, considered a, uh, a representative uh, employer. I have one. I mean, I think the person you might consider is Helen Darling. Um, she represents, um, I can't remember her official title, but she's on the medical advisory panel at Blue Cross Blue Shield. Helen Darling. Send me your contact information. I'll, I'll yeah. uh, invite her to be a part. That'd be great. Thank okay. you. Kate. As of today, Medicare just released this document for public comment about reimbursement for multi-analytical panels for cancer testing, which includes um, cancer sequencing, SNP arrays, and um, all of that. They're actually looking for public comment in the next six to eight weeks. We were contacted by the head of Medicare in for our 14 states or 12 states or something like that. And they're, um, so we're coordinating actually an effort. Um, it's a weird sort of set of states, but nonetheless, we're recording a set of efforts that are actually going to come back with documents to support money analytical testing for cancer biomarkers. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody's aware that, in fact, now is the time to look at what the Medicare guidelines are for somatic um, panel and um, sequencing because uh, they're just available for public comment and they want people to get together in each of the Medicare regions um, and comment from the institutions. So um, Kate, so could you make arrangements to send that uh, link around uh, to, the, uh, to the group? You could send it either to yeah. Ian or to Richard and we'll distribute it so that everybody has a chance to get that. That would be great. Yeah. Um, David. So I, I wanted to follow up on what Bruce had said. Um, there was the discussion of the coordinating committee or the Society of Societies. I know we're not allowed to use that term anymore. This would be a very good topic for that coordinating committee because if they're talking about guidelines or the concept of developing guidelines, in order to, ins to convince insurers that you're acting responsibly, if the societies started telling their members, all right, these are good ways to use molecular testing, that sort of benefits everybody. It's better medical care per Bruce, and it's less money per the insurance companies, and it's responsible for the societies. Thank you. Um, I think we've got time for one more. I, I didn't see any other hands, so Pearl, I think you have the last word. <laughs> God, it makes me nervous. Um, two thoughts. One, I would like to endorse Derek's idea of uh, really trying to put some data behind what tests it is we think should be covered right now and what should be considered with more data. And somehow marry that to yesterday, all of the surveys, I was um, impressed by the fact that there was this universal, uh, the orderers not having a clue as to what is covered. And it would be interesting to know what are they ordering? Are they ordering in the category of what we think should be covered, or are they ordering the wackos? So I think somehow to get more, feather out more data in both of those categories may inform the process. Okay, thank you. That's a, um, uh, that's a good point, and we'll see if we might be able to, um, uh, to, to do it. The, the challenge, is, as I've, I've mentioned um, before, is that uh, because of the current coding system, uh, the, you know, the way that we would traditionally collect data um, uh, is difficult to do because all we see are the uh, uh, procedural CPT codes for, um, you know, molecular diagnostics and we can't tell exactly what test was done. And so whether you're in an individual institution and want to know uh, what uh, your docs are ordering or whether you're looking at it on a more broad perspective, it's very difficult. And even though there are some now um, modifiers that have been added, uh, the use of those has been um, um, sporadic, although uh, the demonstration project that was part of the uh, presentations there um, uh, for their region, uh, they, there was a requirement that um, the uh, a bill as submitted had to have the modifier, so they actually were able to uh, use that to un understand specifically what tests were ordered and do some utilization, but that was really the first group that had larger, broader data, and that was still pretty early um, in its uh, in its stages. So, yeah, this is this has been a problem that you know we've been discussing in, in the coverage and reimbursement realm uh, since I before I was on uh, SACGHS and working actually back to SACGT. 
uh, and we still haven't come up with a, a great solution. Great. Okay, Terry, are you? Uh, all right. 